Hey everyone and welcome back. So this video is part of my data science interview question series and in this particular video we're going to discuss something called the random walk hypothesis. I'm going to start this off with a set of questions that you might get in your data science interview and then after you've taken some time to think about the answers we'll go over the solution. So here are the questions. First, let's assume we have a Gaussian random walk model, which is described by the recurrence you see here. The value of a stock at time t is y of t, and it's equal to its old value, y of t minus 1, plus a noise term, e of t. The assumption we're going to make is that this error term, e of t, is Gaussian with 0 mean and variance sigma square. And all of the e of t's are iid, meaning they all come from this same Gaussian distribution, and they are all independent of each other. Now, if you're wondering why such a model is important, it's actually a very common model in finance. Stock prices are often modeled as random walks, and even the famous Black-Scholes formula assumes that the price follows a Gaussian random walk process. So here are the questions you have to answer. Number one, given the previous value in a series, y of t, how can we forecast the next value, y of t plus one? What if we want to forecast k steps ahead, y of t plus k? Number two, in statistics, we're often interested in the confidence of our predictions. So what is the variance of our forecast at time t plus 1? And what is the variance of our forecast at time t plus k? And finally, the last question is, what is the relevance of the random walk model for financial time series such as stock prices in terms of making predictions? As always, please take some time to write down the answers for yourself before moving on. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to come up with the solutions for yourself. Let's start with question number one. How do we forecast the next value in a series? In order to forecast the value of y of t plus one, what we would like to have is its expected value. So all we need to do is take the expected value of both sides. Also note that we're taking the expected value given y of t. We've already recorded this value, so we don't need to predict it. Since the expected value is a linear operator, we can split it up into two terms. The first term is just the expected value of y of t given y of t, which is obviously just y of t. For the second term, we can drop the given y of t part because the error term is independent of y of t. It just comes from the Gaussian distribution we saw earlier. Speaking of which, that Gaussian distribution had mean zero, which means the expected value of this error is zero. And therefore, the expected value of y of t plus one given y of t is just y of t. In other words, the best prediction we can make in a random walk model is simply the previous value. By the way, you might ask, won't I get a better prediction if I use past values as well? Why not use y of t minus 1, y of t minus 2, and so on? In fact, it doesn't matter. A random walk model is a Markov process, meaning that we already do have those values, but the next values are independent of those previous values. In other words, they have no predictive power. What about if we wanted to forecast k steps ahead? Well, it helps to think recursively. So what if we wanted to predict two steps ahead instead? Well, we can write down this expression as y of t plus 2 equals y of t plus 1 plus e of t plus 2. But we know that y of t plus 1 can be written down in terms of y of t since we just saw that. So our final expression is that y of t plus 2 is equal to y of t plus e of t plus 1 plus e of t plus 2. Of course, we can just keep repeating this pattern up to k steps. So what we end up with is that y of t plus k is equal to y of t plus the sum of the error terms from time t plus 1 up to time t plus k. As before, all we need to do next is apply our expected value operation on both sides. What is the expected value of y of t plus k given y of t? You can see that I've skipped a few steps here because we already went through them. We know that the first term is just y of t because it's given and therefore it's not random. For the error terms, we can drop the given symbols since all the errors are iid Gaussians and they don't depend on y of t. But importantly, we know that the expected value of all these error terms is zero. Therefore, our forecast for k steps ahead is still y of t. That means no matter how many steps in the future I want to predict, the best prediction is still just the last value we recorded. 
that's actually pretty depressing if you thought we were going to come up with this amazing stock prediction forecast. You know, something that looks like this. How do people create graphics like this, you might wonder. Don't worry, we'll get to that in a minute. On to question number two. We now know how to get the expected value of a forecast, but what about the error bars, or sometimes, as we like to call them, confidence bounds or prediction intervals? Using statistics, we know that if we just assume the error is Gaussian, we can find the standard deviation of each prediction, and then the standard deviation times 1.96 will give us our 95% confidence interval. But the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance, so it suffices to find the variance of each forecast. Let's again focus on the one-step forecast first. This time, instead of taking the expected value, we're going to take the variance of both sides. Again, we recognize that y of t is constant, so its variance is zero. Also, we want to recognize again that e of t plus one, the error term, is independent of y of t. Therefore, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. This isn't true in the general case, but it's true when the random variables are independent, and you should verify that for yourself as an exercise. Long story short, we can simplify this to just zero plus the variance of the error term at time t plus one. And that, of course, is just sigma squared, since that was given as part of the problem. What about the variance for a k-step-ahead forecast? Now things get a little more complicated. It's helpful to start with the formula we derived earlier, where the k-step-ahead forecast is equal to y of t plus all of the error terms that come after that. We can take the variance of both sides as before, and importantly, we can simplify it the same as before, by making the variance of the sum into the sum of variances. This is allowed because all the error terms are iid, meaning that they are all independent, not just of y of t, but also independent of each other. What we end up with is that the variance of the k-step-ahead forecast grows linearly with k. It grows by the amount sigma squared for each step ahead that we want to predict. That makes sense intuitively. The farther into the future we want to predict, the more uncertain we become. And so that concludes the solutions for the first two questions. That's why you'll often see forecasts that look like this, where it's just a straight line and then you have two error bars that grow as the square root of the length of the forecast. It's not pretty, but oftentimes it's the best you can do. Finally, let's answer the third question. What is the relevance of the random walk model for financial time series such as stock prices? In fact, this is a pretty famous theory called the random walk hypothesis. This theory was known since at least the mid-1800s, and it was studied extensively in the 1900s. You may have heard of a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which popularized the idea even further. The random walk hypothesis is consistent with the efficient market hypothesis, which in short, basically says that you cannot predict stock prices. That's why our best forecast was always just the last value we saw. Now let's talk about this from a pragmatic point of view. There are a lot of marketers out there who pretend to teach machine learning, and they love to talk about topics like how to use LSTMs to predict stock prices and stuff like that. Unfortunately, it's all nonsense. But wait, you might ask, then how do they produce graphics like this? You might look at this and say, wow, this seems very accurate. The lazy programmer must be out of his mind. He's just jealous because he can't do it himself. In fact, you would be wrong. You see, the trick is, these graphics are very small. If we zoom in, what do we notice? We see that these models do nothing, except copy the last value. In fact, they often perform worse than if you had just copied the last value precisely. On top of that, you can see that when we only copy the last value, we're only ever doing a one step ahead forecast. What about two steps ahead, or three steps, or four steps? Dispelling myths like these was one of the main reasons I wanted to take a totally different approach in my TensorFlow 2.0 course when it came to RNNs. Instead of just doing the same old examples, I wanted to show you what everyone else out there was doing wrong. I want students to stop falling for these tricks and to understand that whenever you see stock prices, it's probably just a gimmick. Except if it's me, because if I'm talking about it, then it's to expose these gimmicks. Now, if you've studied finance before, you might object and say, well, we have proof that the efficient market hypothesis is not true and that stock prices are not really random walks. 
There are some patterns you might observe, and some statistical tests you can do. Here's a problem with that theory, even if it is true that the random walk hypothesis is technically wrong. The thing is, people still discuss this today, and even write journal papers about it. That should tell you something. If this was a solved problem, then we wouldn't have to discuss it anymore. Take Newton's laws of motion, for example. Does anybody debate the equation f equals ma? Certainly not that I know of. If it is wrong, then it's still so close to being right that it takes a billion dollar companies and entire teams of experts who do nothing but work for 16 hours a day trying to beat the market. Imagine that there are people who spend their entire lives on this subject, gotten PhDs in this subject, and you assume that some marketer can beat everyone else in five minutes using a plug and play LSTM. This is completely illogical thinking. 15 minutes of your effort cannot beat multiple lifetimes of study by people who are on average smarter than you, and on top of that, billions of dollars in investment. If you think that's the case, then you are living in dreamland, my friend. That's all for today. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you in the next lecture.